And we're in. Now what? Hi everyone and welcome back to another Nielsen Networking video. This video will be part two of the Metasploit video subseries. That said, this video will focus on the post exploitation phase of an attack. Specifically, what tools does Metasploit bring to the table for this phase of the attack? And how, if anything, can we help defend against such attacks? Okay, now that we understand the focus of this video, let me go over some of the utilities that we will be learning about in this video that Metasploit can be used to deploy during the post-exploitation phase of an attack. For instance, Metasploit can be used to download and attempt to crack SAM database files from Windows machines. It can be used to install key loggers. It can also be used to clear the event viewer, and it can be used to set up persistent back doors and to enable remote desktop on Windows PCs. Okay, and last thing before we open up Metasploit will be to go over the uh, infrastructure I'm going to be using for this video. This will be in my personal VirtualBox infrastructure that I set up just for these videos, just for educational purposes. And for this video, I'm going to be using the Kali Linux machine and the Windows 10 machine. And just again, I wanna emphasize that these are mine, meaning I have permission to be doing this. So that said, let's go ahead and get a terminal open and get going. And first things, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have PostgreSQL um, started up. You'll use this command right here to do so. Once that's done, you can go ahead and fire up um, MSF console. And I'll join you back once we're in the machine. Okay, and welcome back. And we're just waiting, and there we go. So, the first thing we are going to do is we are going to download and attempt to crack the Windows SAM database file, which are the password files from our Windows 10 machine. Uh, now, back in the day, this used to be um, cumbersome to do, but with Meterpreter, they make it very simple to do. So, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do it using two different methods, uh, both built into Meterpreter with a little assistance. Uh, one method uses a PowerShell, uh, but then we're going to go over how we could actually try to defend against this attack. So first things first, let's go ahead and load our PowerShell script for the first attempt we're gonna do. And then we're gonna go ahead and import a script that will actually um, get us the password hashes from the database file. We're gonna go ahead and paste that here. And there they are. So now what I can do is I can take these, I can copy them and I can open up a second window here and I can go to nano and I can just do W10. And inside I can paste these and then I can do control O, save it with that and I can do control X. And then I can run this following John command, which if you're not familiar with uh, John the Ripper and how it works uh, for penetration testing, it's a huge tool to test password strength. Uh, anyway, go ahead and check the link above and you can go check the video. But for this, we're gonna go ahead and run this command now and try to crack these hashes. And it only, only found one. Now, that must mean that the other users either have strong passwords or have already run this before. So let me go ahead and check something real quick. And what I want to check is John keeps a password file of um, previously cracked passwords here. And since I use this for testing a lot, it's probably already there. So let's go ahead and what am I doing? let's check out what's in there. Okay, so see, it already has some. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we are going to delete this John pot file. And then we will run John one more time. So first, let's clean this up and let's go ahead and run it one more time and see if we get all five results. Okay, so we're getting more, including we got the administrator. And as you can see, I purposely set these easy for this is for education purposes. Uh, so I wanted them to be easy so you could see how it would look if Metasploit was successful. Now it is not showing you some of the passwords on here that have strong passwords. And that is the best well, I shouldn't say the best. It is one of the two best ways you can protect against an attack like this. And we'll discuss that in a second. But first, let's go back to um, Metasploit here and look at the second option for getting passwords that is all built in to Metasploit. And I did not mean to do that. I meant to do that. Okay, the uh, second method is going to require us to background our current session. So we're gonna do that. And then what we need to do is we need to type in 
the following command to use this post command, which will um, allow us to dump the hash. But before we do that, we need to then set the session number back. So we're good there. And then all we need to do is hit run and give it a second here and it should return the password hashes. And there you go. And now at this point, you can actually always, you could clear this real quick and you could always type creds and they'll be stored in the database. That is why we started the database at the beginning. So it would keep these. Now these are great and these are all fancy, but they're not um, cracked yet. So to do that, we need to then go ahead and use an auxiliary module here. And we're gonna go ahead and run, um, JTR stands for John the Ripper. And we're gonna run it from within uh, Metasploit. We're gonna go ahead and do it. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go run. And here you go. And it is now attempting to crack them. And here's the biggest downfall to this thing that I find. It doesn't display them out on the screen the way I would like it to. Um, you actually have to go back in and look at them using that um, pot file, which you have to find up here. So we'll cat that in a second here. And what's happening here is it can't find the password. It's probably trying to find my password, which is a strong password, which again is the best defense against this type of attack. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and cancel this because this dictionary attack will be here um, all day long. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna cat that pop file. And apparently we're not because I forgot to put the slash in front of it. And you can see the passwords it was able to find are in there. So it does work, it's just a little more cumbersome. So now, how do you defend against this? I already mentioned strong passwords. And when I say strong passwords, I mean NIST qualified. Uh, last I checked, they wanted at least eight, which I mean, it sounds unbelievable now that eight is what it is, but I would suggest at least 12 to 14, multiple uppercase, lowercase, pound signs. But an even better way, and I can't stress this enough, would be multi-factor authentication. That could save you so much grief when it comes to passwords is having that MFA. Sure, there are ways around it. You know, there's lots of, you can have intercept SMS, there's token, I get it. But you know what? It is a really, really, really um, good defensive thing to have. And it's kind of a no brainer at this day and age. So with that, with that done, you've seen how they can do this. I've given you some ideas on how you can prevent this. So let's move on to the next thing. All right, next thing, how can you install a keylogger using Metasploit? And it's fairly easy. And once we do it, I am then going to show you how to go in and identify on this Windows machine if you think you may have been compromised by a keylogger. So we like to show both sides here. So what we're going to do is first thing you're going to need to do is do a PS to get the processes. And we're going to want to migrate. And I like to pick OneDrive. You can pick whatever process you want, but OneDrive usually works good. So we're going to do migrate. And we're gonna go three, nine, six, four. Okay, and that's done. Now what we're gonna do to start the keylogger, we are gonna do a key scan underscore start. And apparently that's working. So let's go over here and let's make a new text file, shall we? And let's just do test. Hello world. This is a test. Bye. Okay. Now that's all great. And we don't need to save that. So, but now let's go back over here to our machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to dump that. So it's the opposite. We're going to do key scan dump. And as you can see, here are all the commands. Okay. So that is how you would run it in Meterpreter if it was successful. Now, how do we identify this on a Windows machine? So what we're going to need to do again, we're going to need to pick a new process. So let's just go ahead and do, you know what, let's go, let's get crazy and let's go with um, explore. So let's do migrate 2576 and we'll give that a second. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start up and let's do this. Let's go back to our Windows machine and just to make sure it's sending data, we'll go ahead and do that. We don't need to save that, but what we're going to want to do is we're going to run a command prompt, but we're going to need to run it as admin. And you're going to want to type in netstat. 
with a dash and a B. And we're going to wait. And as you can already see, it's already identifying. Look at this foreign address. Why would we have this IP address connecting to us uh, on both system and PowerShell? Right there, you'd know, hey, this is a big problem. And normally, obviously, this is my internal network, so the subnet looks the same. But this would be some random IP. Right there, you know you got a problem. You want to get that machine and disconnect it from the network. You don't need to uh, like shut it off because you want to preserve if there was any data that a reset could cause harm to. Uh, but you definitely want to disconnect it from the internet. Uh, so that is how you could identify it in um, Windows. So now you know, you've know you seen how we can do it using Interpreter, uh, but we've also seen how we can prevent it. And that's the goal of this video. So let's do one last thing here. Let's just check to see if we dumped this out, if it got all those commands. And it, you know, it looks like it didn't capture the net stat. That's interesting, but it did the text file. So anyway, moving on to the next one. All right, next thing I'd like to show you is how easy it is to set up a back door here. And I say easy um, just because, again, back when I used to do this, when I was first starting out, it was a lot harder. And now with, um, not my interpreter, with Metasploit, everything's just built in. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we are going to upload a copy of the binary for Netcat. And you're going to do that. It actually comes pre-installed in the USR uh, share windows on Kali Linux. So that will upload it. And that's all good. Now we're going to need to add it to the registry. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and enter these commands and that will put it there. Now this is going to be the command that actually uh, installs it and tells it to start. So, and what port it's going to run on. So you can see here's all this information, which is actually going to help us on the defensive end. We'll be able to identify some rogue um, nc.exe um, executable. So that, that will be key in a minute. So watch out for that. So then all we would do is that. And then technically, this is just going to be uh, an FYI. So you want to verify that it's actually in the registry. And this is just going to return uh, that it is. And then what you can do, if, if the firewall is on, you need to do this. If not, you can skip this. But I believe the firewall is on on my Windows 10 machine. We'll find out in a minute. And that's opening the command prompt, which we're going to need to find out if the firewall is on. And if we get a response here, we'll know. It is on and it appears it is. So then what we just did there was we just opened the firewall for um, port 6666, which is what Netcat is going to run on. And then we're going to verify that it's there. And as you can see, it is. So now what we're going to do, we're going to exit out of here and we're going to reboot the Windows machine and see if we can get in. So we're going to hit reboot. All right, and we exited Meterpreter because we can't um, use Netcat in it. Let's just make sure the Windows box is up. Okay, it's up. So we're going to come back here and we're going to try to remote in. So it's 10.02.15. We need to do a dash V up here and we need to get a port 6666. And look at that. DIR. And here we are. Just to make sure it's the right box, we'll put a test directory there. And let's go over to our Windows machine here. And let's see if it's there first. Under the C drive. And there it is. Okay, so now how do you find this? Well, it's pretty easy actually. You can do two things. First of all, you can go under, let's see here, it's not user startups. And you can see right here. We got something going NC and that'd be like, well, what is, what's NC? So then again, you could go CMD, you could go um, run as admin again, and you could do that stat dash B again. And what do you got here? Oh, look at that. I, that's strange. Why would this be connected on port 666? So that is how you could tell if you had a backdoor. And I actually think I had this way back in the day because I remember thinking to myself, what is this NC process? I didn't know back then how to check it. I was I had just started out in security and I didn't know, but the machine was acting weird. And looking back, I'm wondering if this is exactly what I just had happen. So that is um, how you can see it. That is how they would do it. This is how you can see it. And I hope that makes a lot of sense to you. So moving on to our last thing, actually two things left. 
uh, first thing we want to do is we are going to open, well actually we're going to configure remote desktop that someone using Metasploit could then use to remote actually into your Windows desktop. And this one honestly is pretty easy to find uh, on the other end and I'll show you that in a minute. So first thing what you're going to do is you're going to run this command, pick your username and password and hit enter. And as you can see it goes through and it's set up. It says it already set up a password, login screen and all that stuff. So we should be able to now go ahead and run the command to get logged in. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is get over here again, and we are going to type our desktop for remote desktop. And I already had it pre-filled, so what you would do is you would put in the username and password you put in, and then you would put in the IP of the machine, hit enter, give it a minute, and it's saying there already is another user, you can go ahead and hit OK. And by the way, I, I just feel like this, this would be crazy to ever do. Even if you know you were doing a pen test or something, you're, you're going to clearly point out that you're um, logging off another user when you do this. So and I just thought it, it is there. It is a feature that they can use. So I figured I would show um, those of you learning uh, Metasploit how to do it. But then on the other end, I wanted to anyone trying to defend against this or just any network administrator, how to identify that someone is in. And this is really easy because uh, you can actually tell it creates another username. That's pretty kind of obvious. So you'll see here in a second. Okay, we are now on the Windows machine. And let's just go and look here. Here's why I think it would be so easy to identify. Like if you go to the control panel and we go to user accounts and let's just see, add or remove. And we show up right there. And sure, you could delete yourself, but at that point, they would show up in the law. It just, it just seems like a really silly feature to have. And I know you could go ahead and you could probably clear the event viewer, well, I'd, not probably, we're going to do that next, but still, there's other log files. It just seems like a really silly thing to do, but anyway, it is there, so that's that, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and go to uh, how to clear the event viewer. And we uh, clear it out of um, interpreter and get it in a fresh session, and then we will run the command to clear the event viewer. And first thing you need to verify that you are running a systems, which means you can run get privs. And if that runs successfully, you are good. You can also do get system. It's probably gonna say you are already system, which we are. And to clear it, all you do is clear EV. And now we go over to our Windows machine and we go to event. Open it up. Go to Windows Logs, Application. And once it decides to load, well, okay, it did its job. Usually it puts a little notice that um, the logs have been cleared. So that is interesting that it showed nothing under Application. Uh, and usually this is what it shows. So, I mean, it does work. I think this is a little suspect, um, you know, if, if all of a sudden, you know, you're a system administrator and you're going to check your logs because there's been like pop-ups or whatever, and all of a sudden they're gone, that's going to be a red flag, right? True, you, unless you back up your event viewer logs, which is also good practice, you're not going to have much you can do about it, but um, it, it would still be a red flag. So I, I can't really offer you anything to tell you, um, you know, how to, how to notice it other than <laughs> they're gone. But that said, uh, overall, the, if I could offer any advice in closing for, um, both sides. First of all, you should only be doing this in a test environment or in an environment that you have permission, such as when you were hired on as an ethical hacker or a pen tester. Um, but those of you on the other end, and when you know this is being done to you, and it's not, you know, it's not at your will. Like you did not hire someone to do this for you. These things I've taught you can help protect you, and they do. And I have used them in real life experience. Um, but some of the best practices are: God, make sure you have good backups, and make sure you have those backups, you know, kept away from your network, if you can air gap them, they're great. Uh, have a backup copy of your backups. I can't speak enough for that. Keep your Windows machines, keep all your machines and all your applications patched. Uh, keep AV on them, endpoint management. Uh, and those are kind of the best the best um, security you're gonna do, you know, topple that, top that with MFA. And you're, you're, you're pretty solid, about as good as you're gonna get, um, unless you have an unlimited budget. And even then, 
you know, anything can happen. So I hope you've appreciated this video. You've seen both sides of the story here. Um, remember, this is for educational purpose. Hopefully you feel like you've learned something um, valuable. You feel more secure. You, you know what to look for. You know how a interpreter works better. Uh, and you understand the um, what can be done after they do compromise your machine. Um, because compromising, compromising the machine is really just the first step of what can happen. Um, so take care, be safe out there. And uh, if you liked this video, you want to see more, go ahead and subscribe, hit ring that bell, and uh, we'll keep putting out good content to you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.